Hi, this is Jazz Obrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast with Jeff Beck in 1980. This was one of my first cover story interviews for Guitar Player Magazine, and to be honest, I was nervous about interviewing Jeff. I'd heard he was a no-nonsense kind of guy who could be a tough interview. So I hunkered down with every album he'd played on and every article I could find about him and prepared a long, detailed list of questions. Our meeting was originally scheduled to take place at Epic Records in Los Angeles. On the morning I was scheduled to fly down to do the interview, though, I awoke with laryngitis. I called the publicist at Epic and canceled. A couple of days later, she called me back and said, You're in luck. There's a hot rod show in San Jose that Jeff wants to see, so he's flying up there tomorrow. He says you can interview him at the hotel. Praise God. The next afternoon, I met Jeff at the side of the hotel pool, and we sat down to do the hour-long interview. As you'll hear, there are the occasional sounds of people diving in the pool and children playing nearby. So this is, in essence, a true field recording. I'm happy to say that the reports I'd heard about Jeff being difficult proved to be unfounded. He was accommodating, easy to talk to, and fun to be with, as we covered a wide array of subjects. These included his time with the Yardbirds and the early Jeff Beck groups, his move into fusion with Blow by Blow and Wired, and his about to be released there and back album. Jeff also offered a wealth of insight into his personality, playing techniques, and his changing relationship with the guitar. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Jeff, why do you think uh, you're a guitarist instead of a keyboardist or composer? Hmm. Well, a lot of time's gone by since I made the choice. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I just... Uh, I remember messing around on a violin uh -huh. and, the, and not wanting to use the bow. I couldn't stand the thought of bowing instead of touching the strings. And that's only something from a child, you know, uh, yeah. age. It was a frustration that bow was getting in the way and when you're a kid I suppose you just want to get out the strings and pull them, you know, yeah. sort of a, some sort of built-in natural thing. But it was more fun because I, I was more accurate pulling the string than bowing it. Yeah. But at the same time, having said that, the, the bow sound was better than the noise you'd make with your finger. You know, maybe it'd be better to move over there. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, as long as nobody thinks that's my new album playing. <laughs> no kidding. What? Turn that shit. Do you feel the guitar is an unlimited instrument? Well, first. For me, it's, it's definitely limited. But, uh, it seems to be limited for a, for a lot of other players, judging by what I've heard in radio, you know, radio sort of rock shows. Mm -hmm. they, all, they all sound like they've reached about the where, where they're going with it. Reached the point of you know, exper no experimentation seems to be happening yeah, on, ge on general terms. You know, obviously, like backroom boys are doing their things, but it's not really getting on record, is it? So, you know, the stock sound is still there, the Les Paul cranked up, the Fender Strat loud. And you get a few nice pedal effects going on the records, but there's not really much to make you sit back and think, wow, that's, what's that? Yeah. And if you do, it's nine times out of ten a synthesizer that's making the noise rather than yeah. the guitar. How has your relationship with it changed over the last few years? How's my what? relationship with the instrument changed over the last couple of years? For the guitar? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I just ignore what's going on around me, really. I have to, because yeah. living where I live, you don't, you, nobody get, I haven't got a hotline to anybody, you know, <laughs> telling me what's going on, but I still think that it, the guitar is as limited as you want to make it, really, in terms of uh, the poetic side of things, you know, you, yeah. if you want to say something on it, but tonally, I mean, it's got a, 
it's limited. Well, you, it's a, if you've got a good ear, you can tell what's been done to it. Yeah, the guitar. Yeah. And you can tell what circuits it's going through, and you can tell that the, the how much the pure note has been doctored up, even just by listening to a record. You know, not even yeah. hearing the guy doing, you know, being there when he's doing it. Do you think you've learned a lot since maybe Blow by Blow? Uh, yeah, I, I've learned a lot and I haven't learned a lot. I've learned that people are ready for anything. But <laughs> I've also learned that it's difficult to continue once you've got someone's attention. How so? Well, all right. So they, they, that album, Blow by Blow, was a, a major change in my life, really. Mm -hmm. But it was that was an accident. It's, and the album was sort of put together naturally, and you couldn't force another album out like that. Yeah, right. So it's difficult to, to make a follow-up. Simply, really. Because you start, one tends to start thinking, wow, that, they like that, they like this. Maybe I should do another one like that. And so and so. Choose the most popular number and then enlarge on that. But I don't work like that. It's, you know, like the old records, like the Motown and things. Yeah. They had a number one hit for them. A star, then that star would probably turn out three records very similar. Sure. In approach, just to play it safe. And also get a, an identity going. But that's exactly what I'm not into. Would, was At that time, would, had rock gotten too stale for you? So rock gotten got too, too stale? stale. Uh, I, re I reckon you're right. That's, that's probably what it was. Is it still? That it is pretty stale. I mean, I. Aren't you tired of oh, like, yeah. all good sounding heavy metal and crashing around? There's only a, a couple of guys. It's just so standard, you know. It's yeah. so standard. Uh, do you listen to other forms of music? Uh, I, I only listen to things that catch my ear, and that's not very often. Uh -huh. but I, like, I like to use the influence, but not get too heavily buried in it, you know. Like, yeah. It's too easy to get marched off somewhere. Yeah. By somebody. <laughs> swept away by them. Before you know it, you, you're copying them. Uh, the way I've got it is, is not very productive. It's not like I'm churning out albums by the dozen. <laughs> Far from it. But when I do do one, at least uh, it seems to be tugging more in my direction where I would be, you know, where I should be. And if I was hot property on the road all the time and journey out more albums. Yeah. I think this works out better this way. Because nobody wants to keep hearing the same name all the time. Yeah. Beck, 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 or whoever it is. Do you do you have to be I in think this... It's an instant death once yeah. you start turning out loads of great albums. Because it's only the pinnacle of your career. And, and you know, then you you only can, can go down. You can't. Yeah. You know, how, how big... It doesn't matter how big you get. It's just... Uh, that once that point is reached, you you can only go down. It's yeah, it's a bit. Uh, I don't know. I don't like that side of it. I like to just turn out an album as and when. I think I've got enough decent material. Do you, if, if people are around to buy it, then that's all I want. Do you do you think you have to be in a certain state of consciousness to play your best? Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. Do you know that. what that state is? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Even after you've played something and everyone's in, you know really into it and you're playing it back, you know, yeah. this whole studio is sort of buzzing, you still don't realise what what it was that made you play like that. Yeah. You're enjoying what's happening at that particular time when you know after, when the people are listening. So are your your emotions real tied in with the way you play? Tied in. Oh yeah, yeah. It's purely emotional. I can't I can't sort of switch on automatic. Yeah. And play like, you know, I can, but it sounds so I've got to be wound up, like you say, in the right mood. And, uh, can, you, can you, have you, are there, have there been times like when you've played better by yourself in a room than you could ever do on vinyl? Or oh, is yeah. it something you can yeah, draw up yeah. on? No, I can play unbelievable on, a, on my own. But then I have to know the door's locked and no one's listening. Really? Yeah. I wonder why that is. Oh, because there's going to be mistakes and horrible maybe goofs and things, but it's good fun. It's great yeah. therapy to be yeah. able to just lock yourself away. Not 
like ear shattering volume, but just loud enough to get the spirit yeah. of, of a stage thing going on your own. That's when you start really finding some nice, interesting things. Do you do you find you use the guitar to play yourself in and out of moods? Well, yeah. If, I, if you get if one gets down that much, really down. No, picking the guitar up won't really help much. Yeah. Because if you happen to play a phrase that you don't like, you're worse. <laughs> you're worse. Are you real critical of yourself? Yeah, they tell me that. And I must be because things take long, a long time for me to get them out, you know. But it's because I don't I don't think overindulgence in anything is wrong. Yeah. Whether it's practicing 50 hours a day or you know, eating too much food, so there's a balance with me as yeah. it should be with everything, you know, everybody. But, and I try to keep it so that I don't lose my technique such as it is, and able to execute the ideas that, are co that come out. How do you do that? By practicing a lot? No, I, I just say, you know, I don't, I don't think I want, I want to practice too much because that depresses me. I get, I get good speed, but then I start playing nonsense because it's, I'm not thinking. Yeah. And a good layoff makes me think a lot. <laughs> it's tough. Do hooks Getting both things going together, the creativity and the speed. Do hooks come to you when you don't have a guitar in your hand? Yeah. How do you yeah. How do you remember them? You don't. You don't. You just don't. You know. Yeah. Something gets stored in the back of your mind, and then you hope that something might come out, maybe in a different form. Yeah. How have your views of soloing changed over, through your career? My views of soloing. On soloing, yeah. Well. Playing with Jan sort of knocked all the soloing out of me. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, a three week tour of soloing, taking exchange solos with a person like Jan Hammer can take you to your limit on soloing. So I've got no particular desire to play 10 minute solos. I mean, those, are, those were never valid anyway, in my opinion. Yeah. Never. Would it was just a, a cheap way of building up a, a tension in an audience. Yeah. And they, I remember in the days of 10 years after, and uh, several other groups that really the people were clapping in a sense of release of tension that you'd finished the solo not because it was amazing or any no I'm, I'm saying that really I understand uh, I, that's what I saw maybe some nights there was a valid long solo but you know, once once one group got away with it all, a lot of other groups started following by doing 10 minute rubbish solos and yeah starting to make people clap and that's wrong it's misleading the people so they all, they all think, they don't know what's going on. They, they look they at each other and say, should we so clap much. now? You know? Yeah. Well, at this point, what do you think a solo should do? At least in the framework of your music. It should do something. It shouldn't just be there as a cosmetic. You know, it should be, you know, it should have some aim. Like, take the tune somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm not saying I can do it, but I, I try. Yeah. <laughs> I try and take the tune somewhere. One thing I've noticed in your playing is you seem to use a guitar in dialogue a lot. You know what, I, well, just going back on that, yeah. what you just said, you never get people saying anymore, oh, listen to this guitar solo, wait till this comes. They talk over it. They, they say, if when the first few bars of the tune comes over the speakers, they say, oh, yeah, hey. And they'll just party over it, talk over it. They won't say, like in the old days, I say the old days, 68, you actually used to listen to things. It's like, listen yeah. to this bit in Sly Stone's records. There'd be some noise or some little solo or even a, a triad on the yeah. keyboard, a jab or anything. A jab on the keyboard, you'd say, wow, listen to this bit. And it would carry the whole thing out somewhere else. <laughs> and now it's just you know, one, one piece of flat music going on. You just don't pick up anywhere along the line. Yeah. Do you think it'd be fair to say that uh that you like the guitar and dialogue. It seems like all through your career, even back with first Jeff Becker, you'd Rod Stewart would sing something and you'd answer. Yeah. And you're carrying it back oh, to yeah. this day. But yeah. I like that. It's just sort of um... Is that kind of an attempt to get out of the out of the routine of having to do a long extended solo or it's not a no, it's I, I, it just comes naturally. <laughs> it sounds cool when you're back. You're just sort of putting icing on a cake or something like that, or holding a conversation with somebody. Really, that's all you're doing. Yeah. You're, because minute, immediately you start making a noise and you're not saying anything through your mouth. You're, you're saying something through the guitar or the trumpet or whatever it is you're playing. And it's, 
I just try and say it as clearly, clearly as possible. Yeah. Because there's no prizes for, you know, speaking double Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can understand. Them. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than a boring sermon. You know, yeah. That you know already, or you don't know, or you're not interested in. You know, it's as simple as that. Really. What What did hearing uh, Jan Hammer do to you the first time, the first few times? Or what kind of influences he had, do you think? Well, he's just a master of melody. His, chord, his chords, I mean, they, they are his chords. If anyone else plays those chords, you say, hey, that's Jan Hammer's chords. But I mean, they're obviously not his. Yeah. But, uh, nobody can say that I've invented a chord because they're already there. You've discovered yeah. them. But he, he plays in a certain way that is unmistakably him. And he's just, well, to me, my ears, I don't, I don't expect anybody else to to uh, dial in on it so, you know, readily, but yeah. it is, it's soloing, just, it's so picturesque. You know, anyone who's got music must like it. Yeah, in, it's phrasing. Mm. There's no, it's not, he's never flash. Yeah. He's never flash, however flash it may sound, it can only be misconstrued as ignorant because he's never flash. I mean, flamboyant, I suppose, but flash. Even even on his wild solos, he's still creative. Yeah. He still finishes off all the all the notes in the in the right <laughs> order. He never makes a mistake, uh -huh. unless it's a mistake in something like a number of bars where you're supposed to change. Maybe you forgot. Or, but when he's when he knows what he's supposed to be doing, I mean, when he knows the number, look out. Yeah. yeah. We played Freeway Jam about 50 times on the road, and not once. I've got a lot of tapes of it, uh -huh. of, the, of the tunes we used to play. Not once did he ever play the same solo, or is even it, in the same, you know, strain. Does that make you play the same? Does that? No, it was, that, that's the fun time for me, was listening to those tapes back and hearing me, the way I was altering, as he would alter, you know. Neither of us copying each other. I mean, uh, if there was a flurry of runs mm -hmm. that he would do, I would take over. And if I did a flurry of runs, he would take over and it would just melt into one. That was That's music to me. Yeah. Have there been other people that you've had this kind of relationship with musically? Um, not, not really, no. Uh -huh. not, not on such an electric level. Yeah. I mean, Rod was, I used to, we used to bounce off of each other. No, because that was just a simple blues yeah. based rock band. There was some of that with Max too. Yeah, a little, but uh, on a very low, low key. So. Yeah. What was good about Jan's thing was it whatever shortcomings it had, it still had energy yeah. and life in it. And it was only the uh, primary stages of what could have been something really good. But it was redundant from the start because he had his band and he wanted to make himself a star. Mm -hmm. with that band, not have me in the band, but he helped me uh, become interested in, in rock music again, and I helped him get where he wa wanted to go, you know, it's like, I mean, I don't know what he's doing now, but at least he was able to play big, huge arenas with me where he wouldn't on his own. Yeah. So I've done my bit there. Did you have a special goal in mind when you recorded here and there? There and back. I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, here and there could have been better. No, uh, I just wanted to get a collection of really good melodies and uh, see if they were suitable for my guitar style. Because uh, there's a million melodies that I could do that wouldn't, wouldn't be suitable. They had to yeah. be right. And even on this album, they're, they're not all, it's not all absolutely 100% Beck material. But if you listen to it a few times, you start seeing other things in it. Oh yeah, definitely. Did you process his synthesizer signal and your guitar signal the same way? No, I don't know. What, what, what well, sometimes you say it's here, really who, hard to who's? Who's? Uh, Jan. Jan. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish which is which at certain points oh, in great. the album. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. good. Oh, that's a compliment. No, that, I suppose there's a similarity in, in approach, uh, but only mentally. It's, uh -huh. uh, I haven't got anything like the same setup as the yarn has. Plus, this is purely electronic. Mine's, you know, guitar. Yeah. But there is a certain attack and bending of the notes and a certain basic 
uh, understanding of the way the you know the tone thing is. Uh -huh. I don't think I, I don't, there was no concerted effort on any part to sound the same or to dial in any trick thing to make it sound the same. That's amazing. How did you work out the material? <laughs> uh, I ripped I ripped myself apart and I ripped Tony Hymas apart and I tried to get him to understand where I was at because Tony Hymas came in as an emergency keyboard player mm -hmm. back in 78 when we had a tour of Japan lined up and uh, we had a problem with another keyboard player and he picked up so quickly and he had such a good ear and musical training was superb, musical understanding was superb mm -hmm. that I couldn't I couldn't see any reason why it wouldn't be a good idea to start schooling him in my, my way. I don't know, it sounds insulting to say school him when he knows more about music than I ever do. Well, yeah. But I, that doesn't mean that that what I'm doing is, is not valid, you know. I mean, it's, what can I say? Like, uh, he's, he's already, in the first two weeks, he already began to see what I wanted without me saying anything. Did the music evolve through playing together? Yeah. Or was any of it written down well, or anything? What, on the album? Yeah. The album music? Oh, yeah, Tony totally writes everything down. Mm -hmm. He writes, he just scribbles on the back with pieces of paper, but... And then I... When we when we run through it, I say, "Oh, well, uh, I can't get along with that. I can't, I can't get along with this sort of uh, this backbone of, you know, the framework that I've got a solo of is wrong or something." Yeah. So I just say, "Look, let's change that. Take this chord out of there and put it somewhere else." It's just custom building the music between us. But of course, it's his songs to start. With. Yeah. So whatever happens to it, it's still his song. Did your album come? Did the uh, album come out the way you had it planned? Are you pleased? No, with I never do, I never does that. No. No. Because what you hear in your mind is always miles louder or miles more wild than you can <laughs> physically possible to get on record. Yeah. And sometimes the disappointment when you actually get the goods coming through the speakers is so great that it might turn out worse than if you hadn't hadn't conceived it at all. Yeah. Otherwise, things turn out better by accident sometimes. Yeah. But you can't you can't organize accidents. Yeah. It's good to have the element of surprise though when you listen to something. Yeah. Yeah. What do you expect from I song? just didn't play as good as I, I know I can on the album. I, I know I can play better than that. Have you ever? But it's just that when you're looking for something you, you're not at your best. It's just you have to take what's the best at that time. What were you looking for? Oh I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're really hitting some hundred thousand dollar questions. <laughs> you know, you, you have to sort of forget that about impressing anybody and, and tailor making your music for a market. That's, that's what I try and forget about because otherwise you'll go crazy. There's enough work to do without worrying about that. Yeah. It's just, um, I don't know, making music is a lot of fun when, when you are making it and you're, you're getting somewhere. But when, uh, and you get stuck in a rut just just for a few hours. It's horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. Is there? Do you have ways of getting out of it? Do you walk away and come back later? Or? Yep. Yeah, I didn't used to, but it's difficult to walk away when you've got ten guys all sitting around, like engineers, um, yeah, uh, roadies, and, and everyone set aside their time in that day to help you. It's difficult to walk out. Yeah. And sometimes it would be the best thing to do, but can't do it and that's when the trouble starts you're you're under pressure then yeah from that time on you're under pressure under obligation to get through the session and then you paying the bill and you think oh, how long can this go on now it's costing me 300 bucks a minute or whatever it is they charge yeah and that that depresses you because when you want to take five and think about things that creeps in you think well there's no progress being made Who's paying the bill? I am paying the bill. Oh, Christ, you know. <laughs> and then you wait for somebody to come up with something positive. Yeah. Once they leave, uh, then you can tail them, tail them for a while. This is it's a movie. laborious thing. I mean, they, they say movies are boring, but shh, Jesus Christ. I mean, at least you, look, I mean, you could be outside and talking to somebody, but if somebody's trying to get a sound or get something going at a technical level in the studio, you've got to be quiet, sit there reading the same newspaper over and over again. Or go out, cool, and then if you go out room. and have a meal, then it's ten to one that ten seconds after you've gone up the road, 
they fixed what they, whatever it was they were. That's what a, that's you just be holding them up. Yeah. I hate recording on that. So I've got a little studio at home, but I, I never use it. Is, is the music you play for pleasure the same as what you record? No, isn't that funny? That's this really. I really like to to do that, but it never seems to work out that way. What's the difference? Well, there's a sort of freedom. There's a free feeling about the stuff that, obviously, uh, there's some wrong notes and things, but the freedom there is what really should go on record. Yeah. In the jams and the open, not jams, but the like you say, the unrecorded stuff. Uh huh. That, that should, that's the, that's the stuff that should be reaching the record. Do but you, it's always overindulgent, self-indulgent. Do you run in like spurts as far as composing goes? There's been times when you've done a lot of composing, and then yeah. other times, at yeah. least on vinyl. Yeah. No, I, I, I reached a point where I needed to be led somewhere, but on a melody level, not so much on a technique or trickery, uh -huh. guitar trickery le level. I just wanted, uh, you know, I mean, the, the stuff pours out of me when when I've got the right tune. It yeah. Just pours out. I can't help it. it just pours out. But. If the tune isn't right, then I've got to push it a bit. Mm -hmm. If it's totally wrong, I've got to drag it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you find, so you find it easier to work in a group than, than uh, to have each individual contribute by themselves? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it usually works out better that way when, when you've got all those guys playing. But at the same time, when you're, when you're playing live in a, in a small room, there's, this, there's all the live frequencies everywhere, and it sometimes blocks out from your mind, the, the essence of the tune. Yeah. And you don't notice that until they've gone home. And then you're listening to the uh, tape recording of it. And then down low on, on a little machine like this one. Yeah. Then you really hear the essence of it and how strong or how weak it is. Maybe some great playing on it. Yeah. And the whole thing may be tight, but it, the guts of the thing just doesn't come across, may not come across. Yeah. And it's that time that you, you should uh, listen to what you've done. Uh, play it to them back on a, on a small tape recorder and say, well, listen to this shit. Yeah. Some of this is great, some is... But it's amazing how, when, when you've reduced it down onto a small speaker, how little there is there. Yeah. And yet when you were playing live, it sounded amazing. Yeah. Because but, the sound was, you know, whitewashing it a bit. But it isn't, sound. you know, when you're first exposed to the great records like the Motown stuff and all yeah. that, nine times out of ten, it's on, it's on a little car radio where it's got to sound good. Yeah. That's the real That's test. Right. You've got to, your ear has to be caught, and you have to want to turn it up. Yeah. Because it sounds so good, like yeah. at any low level. So you expect that's a lot. why that's why all these powerhouse rock bands sound so diabolical because they sound great. I'll, I'll jump up and down and have a good time in a big, big hall or a, a great sounding room. If the if the group's playing nice and loud like the Who, I jump up and down, but I can't jump up and down for the Who on record. Yeah. Maybe we. My generation is still the best thing there. Whoever. I can jump up and down to that. I'd have know, to agree. The live at Leeds version. Oh, okay. Okay. How much is are you? Equipment conscious. Yeah. Not, not really. Not very. I mean, they. Our pit. What you mean? PA or anything? Just your guitar setup, oh, basically. Not really worried about it. It's yeah. amazing. I've still got basically the same top to the Marshall that I have. Uh, with Rod Stewart, it's the same chassis, same valves. And really? Yeah. One, one or two things may have blown up, but it's basically the same thing. In fact, some of the valves, the tubes, have rusted in. Really? The socket, and you can't take them out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, have you kept certain guitars over the years? Now, ones that haven't been stolen. Yeah, I hung on to every guitar. I never sell guitars, really. I just. In fact, one time I remember Max saying. You've never got, you, you've only got one guitar, and, and you've lost that. <laughs> I used to just have one, one strap, because all the others were ripped off. I had other guitars at different yeah. times, but they were all stolen, and I wound up with one guitar. And then I lost that somewhere, I thought, wow, I'm supposed to be a guitarist, I haven't got a guitar. <laughs> when did this happen? Now, well, this was back 72, 73. And that, that remained in my mind, it's funny, you know, it wasn't yeah. serious, it was just funny. And then all of a sudden, I looked around my front room the other day, and I've got about 70 guitars. 70? Yeah. Jesus Christ. How do you buy them? <clears throat> no, they're, 
Ibanez have designed one for me, and they oh, keep sending me these experimental models. They don't take the same one away yeah. and modify it. They, they just build another one and send it. <laughs> it's a nice... They, hundreds of Japanese men standing outside my front room, you know, outside <laughs> my front door with, with, with black cases. <laughs> yeah. No one bothers you. No, they're, they're, the Jap Japanese are fantastic. So efficient and so uh, ready, ready to please, you know. Yeah. They build you anything you want. I mean, they would do that here, but they seem to be extra enthusiastic. So I've got a lot of Ibanez guitars, I mean. but the old, uh, I've still collected a few Fenders. Yeah? yeah? Do you go for the old Fenders? Yeah, I mean, they're obviously the ones you would go for. The pre-CDS type of Yes, yeah. but then any guitar that feels right and sounds good is, is okay by me. How do you find them? Do you go? Do you go shopping for guitars when you're in town? Never, never. Just not. Um, I love guitars, but I would. It's funny. I would never take the trouble to make an effort and go out and look for one. You know, yeah. even if I knew it was down the street, I wouldn't. Even, unless I'd broken one. It was, unless it was like the concert was going to suffer because I didn't have a good guitar, then I might go down and look. Yeah. I'm not a guitar collector fanatic. What do you look for in a guitar? I've got my guitar. You know. Which one? What's that? Well, it's an old Strat. It's a 52. 52? Yeah, it's just terrible. But <laughs> it, it just looks at me and challenges me every day, and I challenge it back. You know. Really? Yeah. It's with the vibrato. It's difficult to play. Yeah, it goes out of tune and all that. But it's when you when you use it properly, it, it sings to you. You know what? Uh, what albums has that guitar been on? Only this one. I've only I've only had it for two years. Uh -huh. But the albums been spread out over 18 months yeah or longer and I think that that guitar wound up being most used I might have used uh, I, mean, I think that was the only guitar in all now is that the guitar you're most attracted yeah. to now the Strat yeah what happened with Les Pauls well they just sound all they you just wind up sounding like someone else with the Les Pauls uh -huh. but I think I can sound more like me with, with the Strat have you have you tried any uh, things like the Floyd Rose tailpiece on your Strat? You know what that is? Yeah, I know, but I like the way Fender makes them. Uh, even though they go out of tune and all that. Yeah. I've got it pretty much sewn up now by using a, a very light graphite on that bridge. Yeah. And on the nut, the, the strings slide on there and they don't, when they rock backwards and forwards, slide along lengthways on the uh, yeah. neck. You minimise the chance of string hang up yeah. over the nut, which is the killer. I mean, that can you can leave you sharp or flat, yeah, according sure. to where you've left the bar yeah. or how how you bent the string. I saw a Van Halen Strat, and he's got his he's got the nut filed about three times as wide as the string. It's amazing and it works. Yeah, but wouldn't that slide uh, sideways when you bend the string? Yeah, but uh, he compensates for it somehow. It's pretty strange. Do you have them modified at all? No, I just I do little things to them. But Anything in particular? I, I kept breaking first and second every single night, and I wouldn't have it. I just thought there's something wrong here. And all it was was the string was chafing backwards and forwards, not on the bridge piece itself, but down back inside the tremolo bar, some somewhere where it comes up through the block. Oh, really? So I just took a piece of uh, piping, plastic insulate, you know, like stripped off a piece of wire and yeah. used the outer casing, slid that down the string, put it behind the bridge and so the string was resting on the plastic yeah never break a string ever now really I, only unless you really you know, wind yeah it up. how do you set your action up high it's just pretty high do you it do has to be because on a strat if you have it too low it just plunks like a banjo yeah do you do your own work on your guitars or do you have a no. technician if the guitar is at my house and I, I want it desperately to be some other way, I'll work on it. But if, if it's in the warehouse where the boys can get at it, you know, my boys, then I'll ask them to do it. But anything that in, involves the actual touch of the thing, the feel, I'll, I'll, I'll have to be there. If it's something like routine, like wiring, I, they do that. Yeah. The boys do that. Do you use uh, any kind of strings over and over again? Uh, I just get uh, bulk, a bulk of strings, like two gross. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm still running on now, I think. Really? Yeah, but they don't, I don't really that fussy about strings. What I mean, about I, the gauge? No, I, I you don't care. No, I, 
I'll start off with a, a soft gauge, a really thin one, if I haven't been playing for a long time. But within a few days, I'm back on the heavy ones again. It's just mm -hmm. the tips of the fingers. Well, you go from 12 to 46 and something like that? <laughs> what, on the, on the whole on range? The, yeah. 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 What's, what's, uh, do you use uh, any pedals? Yeah, I've got, um, I just use a booster that gives me the same sound on the guitar, but louder. Yeah. I don't like to have the tone change too much. Because I, hey, you know, the guitar sounds great. Yeah. Clean. But you want it to sustain, and you want it to sound the same, but a little more body to it, that's all. What kind of booster is it, you know? I've got a modified one at home. It's a modified, uh, I've, um, Modified Ibanez, yellow thing. Yeah. A little tiny box. It's nice. Is that it? That's it. Oh, and really? I've got a flat, uh, a paraflanger. I think it is. Oh, what kind? A, I think it's got a. Is it a paraflanger? Tiger, bro. They only made a few, and I've got, I've got two of the only ones left, and it's amazing. Do you still have any of the old devices Roger Mayer made in the early days? No. Yeah. No, I moved several times. You know, he's After. making his Octavia again. Yeah. He's, he's manufacturing well, one's Hendrix. Yeah. yeah. So he says. Yeah. How much do you think equipment or even certain guitars really matter musically? How much do you think? God damn. How much does what? Cer does equipment or even certain guitars matter to you no. musically? Oh, to me? Yeah. Uh, do instruments and stuff. Really, they yeah, don't really matter. instrument inspire you more than another one? Mm. What, gu just guitars? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, I found that some guitars are better for rhythm and some are better for oh, me, yeah. and they really make you play a lot differently. Yeah, Depending I mean, sometimes you might pick up someone else's guitar <clears throat> and you play more in inspired on that because it's just nice. Yeah. yeah. And yet, having said that, um, if you play it long enough and you go back on your own guitar, you might be inspired by that. Yeah. <laughs> it's change, you know, variety you, that keeps the thing ticking over. Do you play much acoustic guitar? No, no, they're, they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't know, you, you wind up sounding like some folk singer. Yeah. I, I mean, John McLaughlin can play it better than anybody I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. So I'll leave it there. I'll never be like that, so just to sit around and enjoy what he does on it. Yeah. Do you play guitar synthesizer at all? No, I've got one. And it sounds, I can make it sound like that the world is going to come to an end. <laughs> but they're too unreliable. This, this one I've got, we played uh, We played in Spain with it, and the, the equipment was set up in this ball ring, oh, right, no. which they turned into a concert arena. And the sun was 110 at lunchtime. Jesus. Nobody covered up the synthesizer. Uh, it was beating down on the, on the control board. And I'll tell you what, that night, when it cooled off, all sorts of things were happening inside. <laughs> what kind is it, you know? The GR500. Oh, yeah. Do you think there's much future in that stuff? Pardon me? Yeah. Not at all. Do you think there's much future in those? A guitar synthesizer? Yeah. Only if they get the sound to to change and not the technique of playing the guitar. Yeah. Now, if you have to alter anything, then a lot of guys will need a lot of time to readapt to it. Yeah. But this thing, they, I admire it. I admire what they've done so far. It's incredible. But if, if anything, it took, if, if uh, anything interferes with your your fluid sort of playing, then uh, they, you're in trouble. Or if anything goes wrong on stage with them, which they can do, then, then they oh, should yeah. be ruled out. How do, you, how do you keep up to date on the latest developments, or do you? Well, you know, no matter how how it goes, I mean, you might think, well, I'm the first one to use this. Uh, sooner or later, you'll find that somebody had it before you. Do you search out new things? Or, no. Uh, uh, I've got a Chapman stick. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't actually search for it. I saw this guy playing it in a club. I just thought he invented it. I, w I had no particular desire to get one. Yeah. But I just happened to mention it to my manager. I said, oh, wow, this guy plays this weird stick thing really well. Let's go and see him. And he went, he, he tw went tick, 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 you know, up there in his head and went and bought it for me. Ah. <laughs> so it was nice. They're, they're fun so to I've play got with. five years to mess around with it now, see if I can make any tunes. <laughs>
Where do you think the guitar is heading in its evolution? It's a bit desperate. Uh, at Los Angeles makes me worried, you know. It does. Yeah. It's crazy. On the FM radio, I, I mean, I flick through the stations all day, I think for two days in a hotel. Not all day, uh, but sort of every time I was at the yeah. hotel, I flicked through the stations. And it just sounded like the same guy's album on every yeah, station. Those, guys, those, those uh, studio guys all sound the same. Yeah. It got to the point where if you tune into a really good disco record, you were better off. Yeah. Because there, yeah. there was more, although it was... And energy. Less any, depression. Uh, there you say that. There you go. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think, are there any players that you think are saying a lot now? Well, I, I, I really would like to, to answer that, but I... I don't get around enough to, to know. Yeah. I mean, if you think of if you think of somebody that I should go and see, I will go and see him. I know one a guy named Steve Morris from the Dixie Dregs. Yeah, I've heard him. He's incredible. Because Ken Scott produced their album. Right, right. He played he played some snatches of it. I was he's, very impressed. He's very good live. Do you listen to McLaughlin anymore? Um, yeah. But I find it, I find it. I, s I still go back to the old Mahavishnu Orchestra with him. The first one? No, that. Uh, yeah, that one. In a mountain flame, and yeah. birds of fire. Yeah. Usually, that it works out that way. That people play their best when there's a fusion for the first time. You know, a yeah. fusion of talent for the first time. And the freshness is all there. Right. What do you think about when you're on stage playing? Getting through, <laughs> remembering. <laughs> do you play stuff the same way twice, or do you try to avoid that? Well, it will happen. I mean, you, you'll if you. I've never analyzed my playing because I don't like people taping things that aren't for real. You know. Yeah. I like to know that if we're recording live, that. Uh, you know. I, and yet, having said that, I'd, I'd rather hear myself record a live album and not know I've done it. You know. Yeah. But I, I still. I get a bit shaky when I know things are being recorded. Do you ever hear yourself back and go, whoa, and, and here's something you didn't even know you, you were capable of oh, doing? Oh, yeah. yeah that's, that's, Isn't that a shame? Yeah, that's neat. Yeah. It's one of the neatest things about playing in this game, really. Can you always try? You have to keep it yourself. You can't say to somebody, hey, listen to that. I know, but it sure happens, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, boy. Do you ever find yourself falling back on old habits or? or uh, well, yeah, if you don't feel very well. If you're, if you're feeling really sad, you know, ill or something, you might do that. But she, you know, you're unhuman. Yeah. I want to ask you a few uh, technical questions. When you're uh, when you're bending a note, how many fingers do you use usually? Oh. Uh, yeah. For the finger vibrato. Like some guys will do it with three. Yeah. Or uh, one. It depends how tired you are. I think maybe one would do, but you, you might use two, uh -huh. depending on what what context the bend is in. Yeah. So the bend might be a slow blues, in which case you want to get your whole fist around it. Yeah. Or it might be something really quick, and then it'll be a one strip, one finger job. Uh huh. You know, I've never even know. You're asking me questions that I ought to be able to answer, and I can't. Anyway. You're answering I don't them, realize. Probably. I don't realize what I'm doing. Uh huh. What about playing slide? Do you I say mean, I can play a solo. On, on a record, and I can't even play it afterwards. Not, not. It doesn't always happen, but there are some solos I can't play. That you've done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would just be a matter of a few hours, and I could probably learn it parrot fashion. But that's completely not, not what I'm into. You know. Yeah, sure. Leave that thing alone. You know, do something else. Yeah. What Although you... it might be funny one night, you know, one time sitting down, working out exactly where I'm at. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When you uh, when you play slide, do you have the instrument set up special at all? Well, like I said earlier, I've got a, a fairly high action. You know, yeah. To, uh, that usually lets me get through on the slide things I do. But I like, you know, changing guitars is such a, a hassle. You know, unbolting one guitar and bolting another one. Off. Yeah. And it's you... always out of tune. No matter how carefully they tune, they're always out of tune. <laughs> what kind of slide do you use? Just a piece of chrome steel tubing. Which finger? In the middle. The middle that finger? one. <laughs> right there. <laughs> do you always do it in standard tuning? Yeah. You never need no, to. No, that's. I like to use the same guitar for slide, and I don't want to tune up. It would be disastrous to start twiddling around with the pegs on a fender. Yeah. That's got a tremolo arm. 
yeah. to tune up to a, to a uh, slide. Oh, sure. But I've, I've played all, all my life on standard tune, and I know more or less where, yeah. where it can be. What, what kind of picks do you normally use? I've got the rubbish, rub, the rubbishest flat picks ever. They're just <laughs> dreadful. They're, I forget what they're called. Yeah, they're horrible grey ones. And all the edges are all rough. That's the main difference. Well, I don't do? I don't use picks anymore anymore. Finger? I, if, if my finger hurts or I've broken a nail, I'll, you have to use one, but I use all these fingers. How many fingers? Oh, all of them. Five, huh? Yeah. Because the nails are all beat to hell, too. Oh, yeah. I use, I use um, all fingers when I can, but if there's a, a rhythm to be played, then I use a pick. Strumming you, sharp chords. Do you follow any, any uh, conscious picking formulas? No. My fingers just do what they... They do. You know, I have to follow along behind them. When when you're learning something, you're trying to. Do you follow the philosophy that slow is fast. You learn it real slow and then build up the speed after yeah. you get it. Yeah, right, that's that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Do you think um, chords or uh, certain keys have, have inherent moods in them? Oh yeah. I mean, just by changing one note in a chord, you can you can change the whole meaning of the. A piece of music, you know, yeah. one chord. Do you find yourself like, coming back to certain ones more than others, like that are closest to your spirit? Well, I, I've, I've got the situation now where Tony Imus plays, and plays all the chords. Yeah. I hardly have to play unless I'm backing him, in which case he insists that I play the chords that he wrote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How much do you know about the technical side of music? Nothing. Nothing? Can you read music? I know enough to, to, to make myself understood when I don't like something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't read now. Do you have any systems, uh, exercises you do? No, I, <clears throat> I, I just pick up a guitar and uh, if I annoy myself within 10 minutes, I'll put it down. Yeah. If I'm not annoying myself, I'll keep going. Do you, can you pick it up more than one time in a day? Oh, Sometimes. yeah. In the winter, I play uh, on and off all day because usually the front door is frozen shut. You can't get out. <laughs> yeah. You still living on the farm? No, it's not a farm. It's a it's a, just a large country house. And, and, and it's an estate. Yeah. Do you usually There's play? There's no pig shit anywhere or anything like that. No. No. <laughs> That's good. No chickens or anything. Do you, do you usually like to be alone when you're doing that playing? Yeah, I don't like. As soon as I pick the guitar up. I, if I'm in, somebody's there, they, they, I, can't, I can't play with somebody else in, in the room. It just makes me self-conscious. Do you record what you do very often? I, I got, I got to a phase where I just the Japs gave me a little tape recorder. And I used to record every phrase that came up. And it, it just didn't, didn't seem to do anything. I was never playing it back. Yeah, yeah. No, I just tape it and never play it back. What's the what's the hardest part of your repertoire right now? Well, the hard you mean the hardest thing to get over to people or what? Well, the the hardest aspect of what of your playing right now for you are any tunes particularly hard or techniques? Yeah, there's, there's one called Space Boogie that's pretty hard on the album. What's it called for? Calls for uh, listening and counting bars. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> It will come naturally after a few nights on the road, but uh, that way that it will have had a public airing, you know, and I'll understand more what's to happen. Yeah. But it's going to be great. That number is a killer. Yeah. yeah space boogie. Yeah. In the in the course of doing a little research for this interview, I, I, ran, I ran across a few claims I'd like to get your response to. Yeah. Some of the Jeff Beck myths, more or less, or, or claims, you know. Um, you're credited with pioneering uh, in various accounts of feedback, fuzz, uh, pushing the, the sideman forward, and in, in some respects, people claim you're the first guitar yeah. hero. How much of this do you think is true yourself, or how do you uh, view I, I, how do I you view know. your own contributions? Uh, what do you think you've contributed, uh, as opposed to what people say you have? I suppose, I don't know. I Jeez, I That's don't a know. hard one to answer. Yeah. 
Well, all I know is that on America, in America, when, we, when the Yardbirds first came here, all I ever saw was guys in, in blazers and suits and ties playing stock strung jazz masters. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose we, I did bring bring that freedom into the electric guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just generalising it. By freedom, I mean, you know, being a crazy lunatic with one made people think, wow, may not like the music, but there's, there's a chance, you know, now I don't feel embarrassed about opening up and playing. Yeah. And that, if, that, if I've done that, then that's my job in um, a nutshell, done. You know. Can you ever list, do you ever listen to Yardbird stuff? No, no, I find that a little bit too much, too much of a blast, you know, in the past. Yeah. It might upset me or it might make me feel good according to which tune it is and according to who, who's around when I play it. Do you have favorite cuts from that era? I liked, I, I liked some of the stuff we did with Sam Phillips. Oh yeah. The old Elvis Presley guy. Yeah. I'm a man, sounded all right. Yeah. What do you see? There was a kind of excitement there that it's still, it's still pretty hot now, even if you play it now. It's funny, like nowadays it seems you take Beatles and the Stones and all that. Yeah. The Yardbirds seem to be seem right now to have had the most lasting influence. Oh, hey, because, really? Oh, but right. because a lot of new wave is just based on that. Oh yes, yeah. they sure. sound just like the Yardbirds. But, yeah, but without any depth. I think the Yardbirds. One thing they did have, maybe they didn't have the recording technique or the the uh, frilly bits that you can get now in recording. But they yeah. had some magic, some depth. It's amazing too that the three guys, the guitar players in that band, have, have had each has, has had such yeah. a lasting impact. Well, I maybe why not me. <laughs> oh, don't underestimate no. yourself. Oh, I'll tell you what, I, I, the, the crunch the question is would I swap places with anybody else? The answer to that is no. One time, I, you know, you think, wow, would I like to be Pete Townsend? Would I like to be so and so? Have they got a better job than, than I have? And no, I wouldn't swap with anybody. You not seem not to in the have last six years. Further. By far. Well, Page to that's, me is that's my job. Then Clapton's that, perfected what he yeah, what he does, yeah. but it's the same thing. Yeah. And you've expanded the boundaries. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, that's that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying. I'm just doing it. Jerry. Trying is to me means like somebody's scrabbling. I'm not. I don't. I don't think I scrabble. I just you know weigh things up a bit more. What, what would, when all said and done, what would you like to see as being your legacy? Uh, you're really coming out with it today. Yeah. <laughs> no, ask me something else. Okay. Um, do you ever communicate with Beck or Clapton? With who? I mean, with, with no, Beck. I don't even communicate with Beck. He's always out. He's, he's out nowhere. <laughs> Actually, Clapton. Clapton. I've been seeing him recently, and uh, I really take a whole different view on him now because I I've managed to get myself in a position where I can enjoy his playing. Yeah. He's no longer anything to do with my style of you know. Yeah. One time we were blues and uh, he was better. He could play blues better than I can. Yeah. Because he studies and he's loyal to it. And I'm not loyal. I, I try and hot rod it up a bit and change oh, it. Oh yeah. But he's when I heard him play uh, at a gig near his house the other day I was so knocked out. He was slithering around with a slide guitar and sounding great. Oh. And it, all these kids, it was such a gas to see kids that had never heard him play in the Yardbirds or with John Mayall yeah. and see him blasting away at them you know, in 1980. Yeah. That was, that was a buzz. Do you ever uh, hear from Paige at all? No. No? No. What's the, but what's then the... I, I don't ring him and he doesn't ring me. And, uh, yeah. But what's the, what was the origin of Bex Bolero? Oh Christ! I tell you what, that that tune. Well, we we me and Jim Page arranged a session with Keith Moon in secret, right. just to see what would happen. But we had to have some something to play in the studio because he only Keith Moon only had a limited time. He could only give us like three hours. Yeah. Before his roadies would start looking for him, saying, "Where the fuck are you been?" <laughs> so uh, I went over to Jim's house, almost like it was a few days before the session, and. Jim was strumming away on this Shannon doll. It was a 12 string Fender, one of the first. 141, please. 141. Just a 12 string electric guitar that had a really big sound. 
And it was the sound of that Fender 12 string that really inspired the melody. And I, I don't care what he says, I invented that melody, such as it is. Yeah. And it's just, what, I know I'm going to get screamed at because some articles he says he invented it, he wrote it. Some, uh, I say I invented it, but that was what it was. He hit these A major seventh chord and the E minor seventh. Uh -huh. And I started just blowing over the top of it. We agreed that we would go in and get Mooney to play a bolero rhythm with it. Uh -huh. And so then three or four takes, it was down. Yeah. John Paul Jones on bass. Uh -huh. In fact, that could, that probably might have been a Led Zeppelin. The Led Zeppelin. You know, I, I hear a lot of uh, listening to that stuff or the Yardbird stuff. I hear where Led Zeppelin took a lot from you. Yeah, they did. Yeah. There's no doubt. No. I mean, I remember. When, when, when something's been de delivered or directly lifted, you either take it as a compliment or your heart starts pumping and you, you figure out what, which way the guy is going to die, whether a pair of scissors or a <laughs> gun or... <laughs> what, do you hear, what do you think when you hear guys taking your legs? No, um, it depends if, if it's a horrible noise or not. If somebody says, wow, that sounds like you, and it's a horrible noise, <laughs> then, then no, I can do without it. <laughs> Uh, as long as as long as I'm not directly my record sales are not being impaired yeah. or my chances or I'm not directly being thrown off course and it's a compliment yeah um, that blues deluxe tune you did was that actually a live recording no it wasn't it, sounded it real was live in the studio was it a pretty accurate representation of what, what very you were much yeah at the time? That's, that's why we decided to make it sound like live because it, it really did sound like us live. Yeah. We just needed a, a more of a ambience yeah. to it. And we, we thought, well, if we do that, we might as well put some people there as well. Yeah. And it wasn't. I mean, all the time Hollywood movies have been tricking people. I don't figure that one track on an album is anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. And there's a lot of that now, boy. Did, did you have any relationship with Hendrix? Did yeah. you know him? Yeah. What was... Uh, it was a bit difficult because he, we can never, we can never enjoy a, a real close friendship because of what we did, you know. I mean, I was, I was after the wild guitar playing, and he was after wild guitar playing. Yeah. And really, you got. I mean, I liked Jimmy best when we didn't talk guitars. You know, like we went, we used to go out. Sometimes you be at the scene club and it wasn't happening and nothing was you say, hey come on let's go we used to go to the brass rail restaurant in, in uh, uh, New York and you know all the time we'd walk in the restaurant everyone would be sort of bugging us and you know, or Jimmy mostly you know saying yeah. hey Jim what's happening man you know and I'd just sit and listen all that. Yeah. But Jim was fuck I'm really sad about that still now he's not being here. What? Uh, I need I need somebody like that around, you know, that you can believe in. Yeah. I don't believe anybody else. What about Stevie Wonder? Oh yeah. Oh. yeah uh, you seem to have sort of a crossing of the spirit with him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, what can you say? I mean, I don't know many people that don't like Steve. Yeah. He's got that kind of magic influence over people. That's funny. He's great melody as well. I mean, certain things of his I don't like one bit. But then that doesn't make me hate him. I mean, I don't, don't not buy an album just because it's, he's done a couple of things that I don't like. Yeah. <clears throat> what of your earlier stuff do you like? Or do you, do you, uh, <clears throat> are you most proud of or closest to now? Oh, boy. Well, let's, let's take it from the whole career. No. Are there I like times Valera. You, I see, I... Times you thought you peaked? Reached a peak? No, I, I don't think I've peaked because I haven't. It's been so spasmodic. Yeah. You, you know, it's hard for me to think of a peak in these little peri short periods. You know, if I'd been playing all the time, all the time, I could say, well, uh, June '77 was great, and then, and then July wasn't so hard. <laughs> I can't answer that really. It, it would just mean me sitting down for another hour and, and having all my repertoire out and saying, oh, no, no. oh yeah, to be accurate You're about it. Your favorite records yeah, or anything? No. no. Uh -huh. Do you still uh, work with Max at all? Uh, not, not on record. No. 
Uh huh. When um when you had your accident, did that hurt your playing at all? I had uh, two accidents. Uh, uh, it did. I suppose it did. I'm, I suppose it must have slowed me a bit. Well, it does. Really uh, it, it does when you get your head beaten around by on a, on a piece of concrete. Yeah. You wake up and you're just glad to be alive, and you do you do see things a bit differently. So did it affect your playing at all? Uh, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. I can't tell you that. Yeah. What about uh? I can't tell whether it was natural to change or whether it, the crash changed it or what. Yeah. I really don't know. What did uh? What did giving up a vocalist do to you playing? It just made me, made me dig round and, and think of people like Booker T and the MGs. Uh huh. And uh, but it, <clears throat> it made me wonder what the hell could take over from a vocalist. Uh, it wasn't that difficult because most vocalists were talking were singing rubbish anyway. Yeah. The words they were singing were just you know just standard rock lyrics or just jargon that they only then knew knew about. You know. Yeah. I, I I wanted to bring keyboards more out because it's, it's a wasted talent, you know. Yeah. They, they the keyboard players want to do more and go so ding 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 with their right hand. Yeah. And with all the the, uh, the new inventions going on, it's, it's only natural to want to bring that out. Yeah. And and sort of wave the flag at them and say, oh, I'm part of this. I I, uh, I pushed him out there, made him do this. Yeah. When Wired, I remember when Wired came out, people wrote, you got accused in the press of sacrificing too much for keyboards, did the keyboards. You think now it's just Maybe I was just probably uh, quietly nervous about having made an instrumental album and I, you know, I wanted to, I probably subconsciously played the keyboards up in order to rule out any, any accusations that uh, I might be stealing any limelight. <laughs> I, I never try and do that. Yeah. Um, in the live album, did you really do the car sounds with your Strat? Yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, it's just a, a fourths, in between fourths and fifths, slightly discordant. You just get your two nails. Yeah. And you, you can... Of your right hand. You, of your right hand, and you, you block off, as soon as you pluck the bit them with your nails, right by the bridge, you block them off with the left hand. You damp so the strings? Yeah, so it doesn't die away. It goes down. Whoa. You let it just long enough, and then by by bending them down, it sounds like, like the Doppler effect. You know uh -huh. what the Doppler effect is? No. And the Doppler effect is when, a, say, a fire truck comes along, you hear a siren at a certain pitch. Uh -huh. and when it goes past you, if you're stationary, it will die down, it'll, the noise yeah. will go down. And that's that's a, an audio illusion called the Doppler effect. Oh, I see. And, uh, I don't know who invented it, someone like Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> or Doppler, whoever he is. Doppler. But that's that's what happens when a car goes past you at high speed. Yeah. With a horn going, it goes like that. It drops down, and that's what makes it sound quite realistic. Do you have any other unusual techniques you think? <laughs> what making car sounds? <laughs> that's pretty that's just weird. A funny thing, a humorous thing. Yeah. As the song was called Freeway Gang, you know, hey folks, the bloke can make it sound like a guitar, uh, like a car. Now on the live version of that, you threw in that little signature bit from the train kept running. Was that yeah, the yeah, yeah. Do you usually do that on no. stage? No. Yeah. We were just pissed off that Aerosmith. Oh, <laughs> Funny, yeah. The thing that, it was a compliment, but then when we played it, I mean, I, I, I was known for playing Train Kept a Rolling in the yeah. Yeah. And these, these, people, these kids would come up to me. Kids, I mean, they weren't kids. They were sort of 24. Say, so, hey, I like, I like your, your your angle on the Aerosmith tune. Yeah. Do you ever hear the rock and roll trios version? Yeah. Yeah, that's a hot. That's bitching. That is hot, hot. That guy's good. Paul Burleson. He's still playing. Is he in Memphis? Is he? Yeah, I, I did. I got a, to I meet did, him. I did an article on him a couple years ago. He talked you meet all him? about it. Yeah. No. 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 But he lives in Wall. Wall. Uh, it's right outside of Memphis. Real nice guy. Wow. I got, got I'll, to I'll send you the article. I've got to meet that guy. It's time. pretty funny. Yeah. Um, that's really all I got, unless you want to stab right. at that legacy question. Oh, no. no, no.
The transcription of the interview you just heard appeared as the cover story of the October 1980 issue of Guitar Player Magazine. Five years later, I interviewed Jeff again, this time in a quiet Beverly Hills hotel room. Stay tuned for this podcast. Before signing off, I want to credit my friend Nick Hunt for engineering and producing this podcast, as well as Steve Weiss and the staff of UNC's Southern Folklife Collection. This podcast is copyright 2023 by Jazz Obrick. All rights reserved. Catch you next time.